Hebrews chapter 11. I'm going to begin our reading in verse 30. Oh, there we go. Um, begin our reading in verse 32. The text we're actually going to look at is Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. But to give us a look at the context, we're going to begin in chapter 11 and verse 32. Um, if you would stand with me for the reading of God's word. Hebrews chapter 11, beginning in verse 32. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32. I'm reading from the Christian Standard Bible translation. The word of God says, And what more can I say? Time is too short for me to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets, who by faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the raging of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, gained strength in weakness, became mighty in battle, and put foreign armies to flight. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Other people were tortured, not accepting release, so that they might gain a better resurrection. Others experienced mockings and scourgings, as well as bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sword in two. They died by the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins, in goatskins, destitute, afflicted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and on mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. All these were approved through their faith, but they did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, so that they would not be made perfect without us. Therefore, since we have also such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us. Let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will abide forever. Join with me as I breathe a word of prayer and ask for the Spirit's help as we approach this portion of God's word. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that every time that Jesus is lifted up, the Spirit is pleased to help and enable those efforts. And so, Father, my prayer this morning is very simple, that as we seek to make much of Jesus and the calling that he has placed on all of us. May your spirit be present in the one who speaks and your people who hear. Father, I pray it often and I pray it once again that your people would hear a better word than that which is preached through the teaching ministry of your Holy Spirit. We ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I'm sure you've noticed already, if you've been listening to me for any length of time, I have something of an accent. Um, not quite as delightful as our brother Dustin's or our sister Michelle's, um, but I have an accent because I am originally from the United Kingdom. I was born and raised in London, only moved over here about two years ago. London is famous for many things, We've got a huge clock in this middle of town. Um, we've got this really old lady who has ruled the country for a really long time. <laughs> but London's also famous, if you didn't know what those are, that's Big Ben and Queen Elizabeth II. London's also famous for its marathon. It happens every April. If you are not a runner, it's really frustrating because basically the city shuts down and it's always on a Sunday, so... Uh, makes getting to church a little more difficult. But the London Marathon is one of the most famous in the world. In fact, the last winner of the London Marathon just became very famous because he recently just ran a marathon in under two hours. Elliot Chikip Konge, if I remember his name correctly. The London Marathon is this, considered one of the world standards for 
long distance running. 26.2 miles that takes you throughout the entirety of the city. And for those who run this marathon, I've had a number of friends who did run the London Marathon over the years. And as they run the marathon, they tell me that it takes a certain amount of discipline just to get ready to run a marathon. For most of us, we will, so the BBC every year will put the London Marathon on TV if you watch parts of it during the day, as I often get the chance to. It looks difficult enough just to run the marathon, but that's only the tip of the iceberg. The biggest part of the work that's required happens long before the runner puts on his vest and shorts and shoes. It takes an immense amount of discipline to prepare to run effectively. But why am I talking about marathons this morning? Why am I talking about the discipline that it requires to run a race? Well, I'm not sure if you realize this, but you're in a race. I mean, do, do you recognize that? Do you realize that you're in a marathon? Maybe you do. If you do, then I hope this message will be an encouragement to you. But if you don't, if on the off chance you are not quite aware that you are in a race, well, then I've got to ask, are you prepared to actually run this race? Are you prepared to run this race in such a way as to win? I mean, I would like to hope you. I mean, you've taken time out. Some of you have traveled some in big distances to come and to sit under the sound of God's word and to fellowship with other believers and to worship. Clearly, it must be important to you. But I, I've learned that you can't just take things like that for granted. That you can't just assume that every believer who sits in a church, sits in a small group, comes to a conference, even those who are involved in ministry, you can't assume that they all know what it takes to run this race. If you're here this morning and you haven't really given much thought to the fact that we are believers who are running a race, then maybe this message is for you. We find ourselves in the letters to the Hebrews. It's one of those books that's shrouded in mystery. Those of you who love to study your Bibles will know that there's a lot of questions about the letter to the Hebrews that we can't answer. Who wrote it? We don't know. Some say it was Paul. Listen, don't think it was Paul. Um, some say it was Paul. Others say it was Apollos. Some say it was Luke. If you woke me up at three in the morning, chances are I might say it was Luke. But we, we just don't know. Where was he writing from? No idea. Some people say that it might have been Italy because in chapter 13, verse 24, he references those who are in Italy and says that they are greeting the audience. But again, we don't know that for certain. It could have been the author had recently been there. Again, it's just up in the air. Where were they? No idea. Some say it was Jerusalem. Some say it was Rome because he doesn't mention the temple. He mentions more the tabernacle. Again, we just don't know. Thankfully, we do know who he was writing to. That much we do know. <laughs> As the letter says, it's written to the Hebrews. We can glean from the heavy leaning on the Old Testament and the fact that he assumes his audience knows these things well and that they've grown up in them, that he's writing to Jewish Christians who had come to faith in Jesus as the Messiah promised in the Old Testament. That's about all we know with any sort of certainty. It's almost as though the book of Hebrews strips away anything that might draw attention to human personalities. It's like it goes out of its way to be a book that just gets to the point that it's not about people, which is fitting if you know the theme of the letter to the Hebrews. If you have to summarize it in three words, the theme of the book would be that Jesus is better. Jesus is better. The author draws on the Old Testament to show that the Old Covenant with its prophetic line, with its heroes, with its priesthood, with its sacrifices, the Old Covenant has nothing on what has come to light in the dawning of Christ and in the dawn of the New Covenant. 
it would appear as you read through the letter that the audience appear to be tempted. They're, they're, they're tempted to look back, to glance back at what they had left behind in Judaism. Hebrews is probably my favorite book in the New Testament. And often when I've tried to explain to people what Hebrews is about, I've used the imagery of a coach on the sidelines watching a runner run. And he's marshalling every ounce of strength to tell a runner who's tempted to drop out of this race, to press on, to not look back, to put one foot in front of the next. And so sprinkled throughout this book are a number of moments of exhortation and encouragement. And I would argue that you come to Hebrews chapter 12, and it's another one of those moments of encouragement throughout the book. In the passage that lies before us, the author to the Hebrews is going to encourage us to run the race of the Christian life. And not just to run, but to run in such a way as to win. Whether you're involved in full-time ministry or not, whether or not you see yourself as having a special role in the things of God, we are all running the race. And so the question comes then, what kind of discipline does it take to run this race? How can you, how can I, how can we as the body of Christ run the race with purpose? Well, for the remainder of our time this morning, I want to consider four directions you need to look at. Four directions you need to look at if you're going to run this race. I'm going to try and make this as simple to remember as I can. Four directions that you need to run this race, and all four of them come right out of this passage. So let's jump into it. The first direction is this. You need to look around at those who ran the race before you. You need to look around at those who ran the race before you. Can I draw your attention back to verse 1? Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. The author says, Therefore, since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us. If we're going to run this race of faith with a cross-purchase discipline, well, we need to start by looking around at those who ran the race before us. For us to get the importance of this, we need to answer two big questions. Two big questions we need to answer very quickly. So note in verse 1, he says that we have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us. Oh, we need to ask the question, number one, who are these witnesses? So that's our first question, who are these witnesses? And secondly, how are they witnessing to us? So who are these witnesses and how are they witnessing to us? I became a Christian at the age of 14. And so as a 14-year-old reading my Bible and I come across this passage, and I'm sure I'm not the only person who's thought this. I took this passage to mean that everybody who had died and gone to heaven was kind of in heaven looking at us on like massive jumbotrons as we were living down here. Almost as though I, you know, I, you know, I've had aunts and uncles who were believers who have gone home to their heavenly reward. And you know, they're up in heaven watching us and they are witnessing our lives. And so I don't want to be an embarrassment to them in my Christian life. So... Let me run the race as best I can because I've got a load of people watching me. You know, is that what the author of the Hebrews has in mind? Is it that your great aunt Bessie who went home to be with the Lord is currently in front of an LCD screen watching you make mistakes or successes? I don't think that's quite the case. I think if you look at this passage in its context, the witnesses that are being spoken of here are not, well, they are in heaven, but they're not people in heaven looking down on us. I would argue that maybe if I switch the word, this might help, that we are not dealing with witnesses, we are dealing with people who are testifying to us. Well, who are the people who have testified to us? Well, I think a little clue comes to us in that first word in our text. See it there? Therefore. Well, you know, when I teach Bible study methods, I always have this very cheesy line I use. When you see the word therefore, ask what it's. Thank you. Ask what it's there for. Well, I would argue the therefore is connecting it back to chapter 11. Well, what do you have in chapter number 11? What we often call the 
Hall of Faith, this list of people who were by no means perfect. In some of the cases, you look at some of these names and you think, why are these names here? They, they weren't perfect people, but they were people who demonstrated what faith in God is able to accomplish. Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, the group at the end that we started reading with that I call the honorable mentions, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets. I would argue that they are the witnesses that chapter 12 has in mind. Remember, I said there's two questions you need to ask. You need to ask who are these witnesses and how are they witnessing to us? I've kind of given away my answer. It's not that they are witnessing us, rather, they are witnessing to us. They are testifying to us that actually you can do this. And how do we do this? Well, again, just in your spare time, look over chapter 11 and see what phrase is repeated over and over and over again. It's by faith. It's by faith. It's by faith. What was the old Hebrews getting at when he summons these witnesses? I think he's getting at something along the lines of this. Do you want to see what faith in God propels us to do? do you, are you wondering how all those people in ages past made it to glory? How are you going to get through? Well, if you want a good idea, I would argue that the author of the Hebrews is basically saying, look at them. That they witness by testifying to us that this race can be run all the way to the finish line. They did it, and the implication is, so can you. And this is an isolated point, I would argue. I think the Bible makes this point over and over again. I just point you to a couple of verses. Romans chapter 15 and verse 4. Paul says, For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. 1 Corinthians 10, 11. Now these things happen to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Here's a novel idea. The next time you get discouraged in your walk, the next time you feel the spiritual vitality kind of draining out of you a little bit, how about you pick up your Old Testament and read through the life of one of God's people. Do a character study on Abraham or Moses or Joshua or David. There's just so many of them. And yes, I, I want to be clear that the purpose that the Bible gives us these people for is not necessarily just to us to learn some moral examples from them. Let's be clear. However, they are that cloud of witnesses to us. They do testify to us that faith in God will get us through. And there are so many of them. The author describes them as a cloud of them. So many that you can't even number. In fact, there were so many that the author of the Hebrews, who I believe Hebrews was a sermon that was, that was then committed down to paper, at this point in his sermon, he says, I don't have time to go through all the names. There's just so many of them. So many witnesses to the reality that you can indeed run this race. So how do we run this race with a cross-focused discipline? Well, number one, you need to look around at those who ran before you. But not only do you need to look around, here's our second direction, you need to look at yourself and see what might stop you. So look around and see those who ran before you. Secondly, you need to look at yourself and see what might stop you. Look with me at the rest of verse 1. It says, therefore, since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Not only do you need to look around and see those who ran before you, but secondly, you need to look at yourself and see what might stop you. It's hard to get away from the world of athletics as you read a passage like this. As I mentioned, I'm originally from London. 
in 2012, we had the privilege of hosting the Olympics in the city of London. It was a great time for us. Great, great time. And I remember I was in my living room watching the indoor cycling. I'm a big fan of indoor cycling. And that was the year that arguably one of England's greatest Olympians, Sir Chris Hoy, was getting ready to retire. And so they showed a VT of his training regimen, what he went through every day for the few moments that he would cycle in the velodrome. I got sick just watching it. <laughs> He'd get on the bike, they'd have him pedal as fast as he physically could for a solid 10 minutes with no brakes. He'd be pedaling so hard that he literally couldn't walk and so they have a huge mat, gymnastics mat, placed right next to him and he literally would collapse off the bike onto the mat. He's sweating, he's a usually pale figure, but he's bright red. He rests for two, three minutes and then they literally have to pick him up and put him back on the bike so he can cycle again. And after doing about 10 to 15 miles worth on this bike, he would finally collapse on and just be done. But then he'd take a few hours rest and jump back on the bike and do it all over again. You see, preparation to run can be as rigorous, if not more so, than actually running. Well, that's true spiritually. Being able to run faithfully doesn't just happen. Paul said it best to Timothy. He said that Timothy was to discipline himself for the purpose of godliness. Well, how, how do you discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness? I would say one way we do that is by looking in at ourselves. And again, this is not a morbid introspection. This is not a, oh, I'm always failing. I'm always failing. And looking in on self. We'll get to the portion of this passage which tells you where you're supposed to ultimately look. But there is a degree to which we do need to pay some attention to ourselves and to what would influence us in our ability to run. A good athlete, I'm told, knows the difference between external and internal factors which can ruin their performance. Well, clearly, so does our writer. And so he gives us two things that any athlete would pay attention to. See, the runner who seeks to win would firstly try to lose as much weight as possible without hurting their performance in the ancient world. And secondly, they would wear either light clothing or in some of the cases of the games, no clothing at all. Why? Because that gave them freedom of movement. Well, those two ideas, those, that idea of something internal to us and something external to us, I would argue they're picked up by our author. And as he does so, he wants us to ask the question is that as we look at ourselves, what could possibly stop us? Well, he mentions two things in particular. Now that he starts off and says, see there in verse 1, lay aside every hindrance. Some of your translations will have the word weight. Same idea. In other words, lay aside anything which slows down your spiritual progress. The word that's used here was used for laying aside clothes. It was what, like I said, some athletes would do as they were running because they didn't want to be weighed down, and so they would run naked. Well, let's pause there for a second. Are clothes inherently bad? They're not. It would be very, very concerning if we all turned up with no clothes today. Clothes in and of themselves are not bad things. But in the context of trying to run a race, some clothing is less practical, less helpful to us as we try to run the race. I am not the marathon type, but if I was, I probably would not wear what I'm wearing right now. This works great for preaching. It does not work great for trying to run 26.2 miles. And I think that's important because, bringing it back to our text, a weight it's, or a hindrance is not necessarily something sinful. 
John MacArthur in his commentary on this section says, often a weight is something perfectly innocent and harmless, but it weighs us down, diverts our attention, saps our energy, dampens our enthusiasm for the things of God. A weight is whatever will slow you down as you seek to run this race. I used to play rugby. Absolutely loved the sport. So much so I got injured and that was the end of my, well, non-existent rugby career. But I love rugby. It's a nice, energetic sport for a big guy like me. I've been 5'10 since about the age of 11. So when you're that big, certain sports just don't work for you. I'm from the UK. We all love football. Football just does not work for me. So rugby, I came to really love. It wasn't the most amazing at it, but I enjoyed it. One of the guys that I used to play with, he's since gone home to be with the Lord. He used to obsess about the kind of shoes that he'd wear. He'd only ever buy, from a partic- buy shorts from a particular brand. Rugby shirts are very distinctive in the way that they're made. He'd only buy particular kinds of shirts because he recognized that when you're trying to run 60 yards, then the, 60 yards faster than the 250, 300 pound, 511-61 guy who's chasing you, the last thing you need is to be weighed down by impractical clothes. Well, the author to the Hebrews understands this. He recognizes that in the race of faith, you can't afford to be weighed down. So let's get practical for a second. We're going to ask you to answer me, but think about what is it in your life that's weighing you down? What is it that stops you from running the race. Here's the thing. It might be a good thing. In any other context, it may be perfectly fine. By the way, what may be a weight for you might not be a weight for someone else. I grew up in a tradition where TV ownership was a really bad thing. You shouldn't own a TV because if you own a TV, you're going to be tempted to watch it all the time and to neglect spiritual things. Well, that was never the problem in our house. So we owned a TV. And it was always fascinating to me. My dad's a pastor. And I would constantly, we would constantly have people around the house. And I would listen with fascination as they low-key and sometimes not so low-key, judged our family for the fact that we owned a TV because, oh, I couldn't possibly own a TV. A TV would only make me distracted in my faith. And my dad's like, I barely watch this thing. (laughs) I have this so I can see the news. What may be a weight for you may not be a weight for somebody else. But you do need to ask the question, what is that thing? What are those things that may be weighing you down. Here's the thing, once you identify them, the author of the Hebrew says you have to lay that aside. I would argue that's a really polite way of saying get rid of it. (laughs) Certain activities might need to go. Certain affections might have to be reined in. Certain affiliations might have to come to an end. Whatever it takes, get rid of it. But not only is there the danger of legitimate things that can weigh us down. Again, look at our text. He says, lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Some of your translations may have, which cling so closely to us. Same idea. Now, commentators kind of quibble among themselves. Is this sin in general that's being discussed or particular sins. Translations generally kind of give the sense of this being general. I will agree with the ESV translation on this one, which translates it as just sin, which clings so closely, makes it much more general in nature. I would argue that makes sense given the context. Because not only do you have good, but maybe unhelpful things that are weighing you down, but there's also sin which needs to be dealt with. As we seek to run the race of faith with a cross-focused discipline, sin has the ability to entangle, to ensnare us, to trip us up. If 
the hindrances or the weights are things that are external to us. Sin is something that's internal. It's close enough to ruin the race for you. The Bible is painfully clear when it comes to this, Romans 8, 13. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. I know I'm in a predominantly reformed audience. We've all heard the line from John Owen more than once. Be killing sin or sin will be killing you. If unnecessary things can slow you down, Notice he says that the sin that so easily ensnares us. I grew up in the King James Bible. The King James Bible says the sin which so easily entangles us. If these weights and hindrances can slow you down, sin will have you, quite frankly, falling over yourself. And maybe this morning, as the word of God is coming to you, you recognize there's a sin in my life that I need the Spirit's help, that I need the power of the gospel to help me fight against because it's weighing me down, it's slowing me down, it's tripping me up. The author of the Hebrews says that we need to lay aside every hindrance and the sin which so easily ensnares us. So how do we run this race with a cross-focused discipline? Well, by looking around at those who ran before you, by looking in at what might stop you. Well, all that is preparation, though. Once you're dealing with those things, and the idea is that it's an ongoing dealing with these things, well, now you're dealing with them. You need to actually run the race. So direction number three, you need to look ahead and run the race before you. You need to look ahead and run the race before you. So again, look at our text. The author says, let us run with endurance the race that lies before us. There's a few observations. First, it's interesting he uses this language of the race that is run before us. That's why I had to start our time together thinking about the idea of a marathon. Because the race of faith is a marathon. It's not a sprint. It doesn't require just one quick burst of energy in which this race is soon over. I have a brother who is much more athletic than I. And Joshua used to run the 60-yard dash. He was good at it. But to run an effective 60-yard dash takes just one quick burst of energy. My brother is blessed with really good acceleration. He can just go. But that's not how a marathon works. See, a marathon doesn't take one quick burst of energy. It requires sustained effort over a long period of time. Well, if it takes sustained effort over a long period of time, then what you need is, well, the author tells us, endurance. If you read the Bible, the Bible says a lot about endurance. Jesus often taught his disciples about the need for endurance or patience. In Luke 8, as he gives the parable of the sower, he reminds them that it takes time to wait for seed to grow. In Matthew chapter 10, as he sends them out, he calls them to endurance with the circumstances that they're going to face. Even in the letters of the Hebrews, the idea of endurance has already come up. So in chapter 6, verses 11 through 15, he mentions the example of Abraham, who had to have endurance waiting for that which God had promised. If we're going to run the race of faith with a cross-focused discipline, then we need to have endurance. I'm not a very patient person. I got married two years ago, prior to getting married. I heard people say this all the time, and then I got married, and I realized it's really true. I thought I was a really patient person. I I really did. And then I got married, and I realized, no, no one's just tested my patience yet. (laughs) 
I'm the type of person, I hate being late to things. Hate it. And so I'm the type of person, I give myself a good hour to get ready before I go anywhere, just so I can leave early, be there on time. My wife, not so much. <laughs> I remember the first Sunday we went to church together. Got up early, got dressed, I'm sitting there. Babe, you ready yet? No. <laughs> Babe, you ready yet? No. <laughs> We've now got 10 minutes to get to church and I'm getting a little antsy because I'm realizing that mm, I'm not as patient as I thought I was. <laughs> That's a rather comical example, but I think we all recognize that in more ways than what we all need to develop more endurance and more patience. But how do we develop this endurance? Well, we read Romans 15.4 just a few minutes ago. We can develop such endurance with the help of the Scriptures. As we read the faithfulness of God who fulfills His promises, as we read of the ultimate end of those who persevered in faithfulness, God takes the things we see in His Word and by His Spirit works out the graces necessary for us to have endurance. So if we're going to run this race, we have to run it with endurance. But let's be clear, it's not endurance that we need to work up within ourselves. It's endurance that God himself will give as we fall upon him and we ask for his grace and his help. And we just lean upon him in total dependence. So far in this message, I've said a lot about what we need to do. I don't apologize for that. It's, I'm just following the flow of this passage. But if I stopped here, my brother Michael Coglin is here. Yesterday we were talking a little bit about this, and um, I mentioned that it's very easy for us to stop in verse 1 and kind of just make this a program that we need to achieve. It's very easy for a passage like this to become a guilt trip. It's very easy for a passage like this to become another set of things for us to do, a new law that we need to follow. And let's be clear, there are commands in this passage that we have to obey. Let's not become squeamish about the word obedience. But if we're going to obey rightly, we need to get to the matter of motivation. Not just what am I doing, but why am I doing it and how am I doing it? And so we need this final direction because I think this gets to the matter of motivation and it gets to the matter of why we are doing what we are doing. Number four, you need to look up to Jesus, the example for you. You need to look up to Jesus, the example for you. So look at verse 2. He says, keeping our eyes on Jesus, or looking to Jesus, some of your translations will say, the source and the perfecter of our faith. You need to look up to Jesus, the example for you. Sure, we may glance at others. I mean, I would argue that's the whole point of Hebrews chapter 11, that we glance at their examples and their examples encourage us. Sure, we may glance at others, but our gaze, our fixed and determined look ought to be on the Savior. If we're going to run the race with a cross-focused discipline, you need to have... I like puns a lot, so I apologize. I have to get one in. You need to have the sun in your eyes. Not the big star in the sky, not the S-U-N, but the S-O-N. One preacher of old put it like this. He called it a formula for spiritual success. He said, if you want to be distressed, look within. If you want to be defeated, look back. If you want to be distracted, look around. If you want to be dismayed, look ahead. But if you want to be delivered, look up. He 
Just keep our eyes on Jesus. And why do we keep our eyes on Jesus? Well, note who he says Jesus is. He says that he is the author, the source, excuse me, and perfecter of our faith. I said, like I said, I've got most of my verses in my head memorizing the King James Version. King James Version says, the author and finisher of our faith. The faith you have didn't start with you, and the faith that you have will not get you into glory with you. You have to look to Jesus. He is the one who is the author and the finisher of our faith. He is the source of it, and he is the perfecter of it. And it's interesting he says that we're to look to Jesus who is the source and the perfecter of our faith. And the reason we can look to him is because Jesus himself was committed to a race. And he ran it. Note what he says. He says, for the joy that lay before him, look at there in verse 2, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You want a motivation for running the race effectively? Look no further than the very Son of God. In order to be able to make it through, what does he say? He said he endured the cross. Why? Because of the joy that lay before him. Jesus had his eyes fixed on glory, and in having his eyes fixed on glory, it enabled him to go through everything that he went through in his humiliation. No, they says that he despised the shame. That yes, his humiliation was indeed a humiliation, but that's not where his eyes were. That knowing that there was a joy that lay before him, that he would be bringing, as the author of the Hebrew says, many sons to glory. That as Isaiah 53 says, that he would justify the many. As he knew that that was going to take place, that propelled him. To go to the cross. But he doesn't remain on the cross. <laughs> yes, he went to the cross. Yes, it from a human perspective, it looked bad. But that's not where the story ends. The Bible says that he endured the cross, despising the shame. And where is he right now? He is sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. If I can use a modern colloquialism. Jesus, as it were, from a human perspective, took an L. A really bad one. but it was a temporary L, if you will. Because now he sits enthroned in glory. And by the way, he's at the right hand of the throne of God. He's the one, the Bible says, he's interceding for us. That's why we can, as one of my friends back home likes to say, we can fail forward. That when we fail and when we are faltering and when we are weak and when we are tempted to think, oh God, I'm in so much trouble. That there's one who sits up in heaven right now who is through the merits of what he did on the cross interceding for us. That his wounds speak for us before the Father. That gives us so much hope as we seek to run this race. And so, my brothers and sisters, as I close out this message, I want you to come out from here encouraged. I want you to come out of here strengthened. I want you to come out of here recognizing that this cross-focused discipline that we are called to doesn't emanate from us, and it's not left to us to figure out how to do this. Ultimately, we rest 
in Christ and his intercessory work. And as he intercedes for us, he is not just interceding for us when we get it wrong, but through the ministry of the Spirit that he sends, that he has poured out, he is empowering us to run the race. Because you want to, okay, what's the application, preacher? What do you want us to do with this? One word. Run. Run, believer, run. And run recognizing that it's not ultimately in your own strength. But because we have one who is seated at the right hand of God, who has blazed the trail that we're able to walk on. Amen? Join with me as I breathe the word of prayer as we close. Our eternal God, we are so thankful that seated in heaven right now is one who understands what it is to run a race. Who understood, who understands rather, what it is to keep his eyes fixed on you, even in the midst of a world that would do everything to distract and to disqualify us. Father, help us that we would always be those who run with the cross in our eyes, with a cross-focused discipline, not a willpower discipline that will dissipate given the first sign of trouble, but through the power of what you have done in the gospel of Jesus Christ, help us to run and to run well. Father, may this time that we gather together for the rest of this day be used by your Spirit to help us as we seek to run the race well. We ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.